so today is our uh, February installment of Books and Bagels. Um, we have the first ever dual presentation coming up between two people. That'll be fun. And then we have this lovely lady presenting alone. Um, super boring. Um, just kidding. It's going to be great. Um, and, uh, and I'll let the Adam Fontecchio from the Grad College, who's also a professor of electrical engineering. Yep. Yes, got it. Um, So with that, let's let's jump right in. Um, our speakers have something like 15 minutes each. Um, they're going to give their presentations. They usually run a few minutes long. We'll see. I'll wave at you if uh, you're, you're running significantly long. Uh, we'll open it up for a bunch of questions, and uh, we'll see where we land, and then apparently we'll be allowed to have some, some food after that. Um, all right, so our first speaker uh, is going to join us, Caitlin Dillard. Uh, she's going to talk to us about electrospinning nanofibers for energy applications. You probably don't know that I do electrospinning, so we'll have some fun questions. <laughs> and you are a PhD student in chemical and biological engineering. Yes. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Adam and Katie. Thanks GSA for inviting me and everyone else here for participating in this. Um, again, my name is Katie Dillard. I'm in the chemical engineering department. I'm in my fifth year of my PhD. And I work with Dr. Kara on electrospinning nanofibers. And our entire lab works on electrospinning these nanofibers for energy devices. So we mostly focus on batteries and supercapacitors. Uh, in the past, we have done a little bit of work with fuel cells and solar cells as well. Um, so today, it's going to be pretty uh, general about energy, energy materials, and then some benefits of electrospinning and why we use it and how we implement it in our energy devices. So I think we can all agree energy is a pretty top problem uh, in terms of science. What researchers are working towards is um, reducing our energy consumption or moving towards renewable energies. And uh, Richard Smalley, uh, a previous Nobel uh, Prize winner, once claimed that energy is one of the top issues that our society faces this century. And it's a really interesting lecture and article um, that he wrote. Um, well, he presented a lecture first, and he talks about how energy itself is really critical and how it impacts each one of these factors on this list. And, you know, just to put it in terms of numbers, uh, in the U.S. Uh, Energy Information Administration, they estimated that there's going to be close to a 50% increase in the energy demand over the next 20 or 30 years. Um, so the main thing that we need to consider is where is this energy coming from? Um, and for the United States, most of it is coming from fossil fuels. Uh, about 80% of it has come from coal, natural gas, or petroleum. Um, but only 10% has come from renewable energies. So really, what's the problem there? Why, why should we move away from fossil fuels? And I think the number one obvious one that I didn't list here is environmental concerns, but I'm trying to avoid the environmental climate change debate. Um, but obviously, that's a huge concern. Uh, but some other obvious concerns that you can't deny are that fossil fuels will deplete. At some point, I mean, obviously, we can find reserves that are just popping up, but scientists don't really know when we are going to run out. And also, you have to think about political and economic concerns. Um, the countries that are really rich in, in oil might not necessarily export to a lot of other countries. So 
these types of fossil fuels might not be accessible to other countries that don't naturally have reserves. So one, one uh, very elegant solution would be to convert everything to renewable energy sources, right? Like sun, wind, uh, water. You know, there's no threat of depletion of these resources and they're also much more accessible to everyone. So why aren't we using them yet? Well, for one, uh, at the current state, uh, a lot of these renewable energy devices or resources aren't easy to harness because they're very expensive to build these devices. Um, and a pretty crude example is just showing on this map of the United States, there's a little red square that you can see, hopefully. Um, it's about the same land area as uh, the state of New York. And the idea is if you fill that entire area with the average solar cell, rooftop solar cell, you, we would be able to generate the energy needed for the United States. Why haven't we done that then? If it seems like such a small land area, well, realistically, we would have to install about a half a million of those typical solar cell rooftop panels every single day from now until 2050 to achieve that. Um, so obviously, that's not happening right now, so that's kind of pushing back our date, um, but that would be just for solar energy. Obviously, there are other issues associated with renewables. Um, if we look at, in terms of energy storage, that's another huge factor. Because for energy storage, you need to store on, you know, for, well, let's go back to the solar example. If you have a lot of sun shining one day, you're producing extra electricity for your house that you don't really need. And then the next day it's cloudy. You're not going to get the same amount of electricity. So on that sunny day, you want to be able to store that amount of energy for when you need it again. And then there's also off-grid applications. So um, a lot of military or space applications, you're not going to be connected to the grid or you know, in remote areas, but also for portable uh, mobile devices or mobile applications, um, even electric vehicles. So to replace you know, coal, oil, gas, you really need to use renewables in conjunction with better energy storage systems. So how can we bring up better energy storage and, and greener energy uh, resources? And that's you know, our ultimate goals as researchers um, is looking to improve these devices in terms of maybe their efficiency um, while lowering the cost. So ideally, if we lowered the cost of current solar cells, we could implement them a lot better, right, on a much bigger scale. But since um, currently the cost is a little too high. Um, and one way that we can achieve this is looking at better material chemistries. So some scientists are actually developing uh, different molecules or chemistries that are inherently better. They can convert more uh, sun or, you know, wind or whatever to energy or to electricity uh, per size. So you can either find a better material or chemistry or we can, you know, the second approach would be looking at better processing techniques. And when I say processing techniques, I mean how we actually fabricate these cool materials into a usable uh, component in a, in a solar cell or a battery. Um, and one example would be silicon solar cells. Um, so to actually fabricate really high efficiency silicon solar cells, you really have to put a lot of energy during the process to form this super, super pure uh, silicon. And it's so expensive that that isn't the silicon that's going on your rooftops. Um, so in, in a sense, you end up sacrificing efficiency to make this lower cost um, so that people can afford to put them on their roofs. So we really look to improve device efficiency without compromising cost and vice versa. So one, uh, one direction uh, a lot of people go through, especially materials people um, and, and research, is looking at the material level. So we want to look at different nanomaterials that can be useful for energy devices. And there's a lot of different classes starting from zero dimensional materials. So these are the actual molecules that have excellent electrical properties, physical properties, chemical properties that are needed to convert sun to electricity or to store uh, energy to be used you know, for my laptop later today. Um, and as you build up these mo molecules, you form one dimensional uh, fibers, rods, uh, wires, which is where our work fits into. And then you keep building these uh, materials up and up till you get 3D bulk material. Um, and the problem is as you grow this, you know, these really fundamentally good materials, you get these bulk properties that don't have quite the same as you know, at that nano level. 
So a lot of people have been really interested in one-dimensional materials because you're a lot closer to getting those properties and keeping them from the zero D. Um, but you have a lot more uh, connect, uh, connectivity and you can easily build up these 1D materials. So with that being said, um, our lab looks at nanofibers in this 1D class of materials and we use electrospinning. So electrospinning is a very advantageous technique. Um, it's relatively simple to form fibers. Um, you basically apply a really, really strong electric field to a polymer solution and some grounded collector, and as the polymer solution is being drawn to it, you get very, very, very thin fibers. And this image shows these, uh, just an example of what these fibers can look like. And to give you a perspective, nanofibers can be anywhere from 100 to 1,000 times thinner than a human hair. So they're very, very small. You can't really see them to the naked eye. Um, so here, here are some videos. I think it's a little bit easier to see this. Um, so this video I'm going to start, there's, you can see all the way on the left is the needle and the tip of the solution. And as the, they applied a really strong electric, electric field, it overcame that solution's uh, surface tension. So then it forms these really thin fibers uh, that get collected into like a non-woven fiber mat. So then another uh, pretty advantageous thing with electrospinning is that it is scalable. Some, uh, obviously there are some challenges associated with scaling it up to industrial level production, but overall some companies such as DuPont have created these large scale setups. And this is an example of what that would look like. So on this, all the way on the right, we have a needle with a droplet of, of a really thick polymer melt solution. And on the left, we have a rotating drum. So that has some really strong electric field applied to it. So you'll see it draws that fiber droplet or that uh, polymer droplet. And as soon as it sticks to that rotating drum, as it turns, you see that fiber thinning out. Um, so this is more commonly found on the industrial scale. Oh, nope, don't need to skip again. Cool. Um, another really uh, crucial thing with electrospinning is that it's extremely versatile, and that's why we're so motivated to use this. Um, on the left are two images of we're actually combining two different polymer materials. And just by electrospinning two different materials, you can obtain very different structures. Uh, in the first picture, there are actually two different materials are lined. There's like the black material and the white material. In this image, that's basically what it looks like. And then next to it, they're aligned horizontally along the fiber. And that was just from different conditions during electrospinning or post-processing. In the middle, we have two images of what are called core shell fibers. So from electrospinning, you can actually get one material on the inside of the tube and one on the outside of the tube. So you have two different functioning chemistries or materials, and they're pretty easy to obtain, either during electrospinning or after. And the, the third column, uh, the last image, we can see uh, nanofibers where we actually deposited another material or nanoparticles or crystals to the surface of those nanofibers. So all of these structures are just based on what application you need, whether you're working in batteries, um, or solar cells, and what component you're trying to design. And then on, on the end, it's just a few schematics of how we can easily uh, create these types of structures. So lastly, I just want to show um, a, a couple images of these fibers because, you know, we're, we're creating these really unique structures and chemistries at such a small scale, um, but they're very strong and they're easy to handle. So in the first three images, you can see we actually have a nanofiber mat and then it being hole punched. And we have these little disks that we can use as electrodes that we actually put into supercapacitors or batteries. Um, and on the right, I have a little video showing another application would be, oh, it's a little, well, I didn't shake that much when I did this. Um, it's just a video showing um, that we can also make these nanofiber mats very flexible. So this can be really important in, um, in the future and, uh, even niche markets like wearable devices or smart fabrics. Um, so you don't have to worry about your electrodes or components cracking while, um, while it's in use. Wow. That's weird because the other two were connected to the internet and this one's downloaded on my computer. But anyway, you can see. Yeah, like always. So um, yeah, so they're very flexible. They're strong um, depending on what material you're spinning. Um, but yeah, I just kind of wanted to demonstrate that. And then just a kind of wrap it all up, I wanted to kind of give you an example of how we take these fibers and put them in a device. 
Um, so here I have a schematic of a coin cell that I make. So these are the types of batteries that go into watches. And this is what I make now. Um, and I actually use my nanofibers with one other post-processing step. And I just put that directly into a battery. Um, and then I test my battery. So ideally, these would be able to beat lithium ion batteries. Um, but yeah, we also use these types of nanofibers and directly in supercapacitor devices. And we have done some work uh, on fuel cells and solar cells as well. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And I'm excited to take any questions. Thank you very much, David. Um, so I'm, I'm getting my instructions from GSA that I think what we'll do is do our second presentation and take all of our questions. Perfect. That's all right. Then thank you. Thanks. And maybe while our next speaker's set up, you can tell me if you can put the coin cell in my Apple Watch so it'll last more than like five hours. Currently, no. maybe, maybe. <laughs> I don't think so. We're still working out a few kinks on the lithium sulfur cells. All but. right. But the watch got inspired. Fire we can try. <laughs> yeah. That's cool, right? It can heat me when I'm Yeah, scared. probably not a good idea because right yeah. now we're still using pure lithium as our cannons. <laughs> Might not be a good idea. Excellent. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, so we'll, we'll ask all of our uh, speakers to join us for questions as soon as we're done with the next presentation. So our next speakers are Jessica Liu and Lee Joy. And they're going to team talk to us. This is going to be fun. Right? Slightly different topic here. We're going to hear about supermarket victory, right? Sports nutrition training toolkit for dielectric professionals. Uh, you are MS students. The floor is yours. <laughs> so not dielectric. We're gonna yeah. <laughs> try to pull us into the engineering uh, field. So hi, my name is Leah Choi. I'm Jess. And so we're presenting on our supermarket victory and how we created a sports nutrition training toolkit for dietetic professionals. We are currently MS students in the human nutrition program with the College of Nursing and Health Professions, and we are in the didactic program in dietetics right now. Um, we also, this is useful for our presentation, the sports, uh, the Drexel Center for Nutrition and Performance is a collaboration between the College of Nursing and Health Professions and Drexel Athletics. So we provide a lot of support to our athletes in that sense um, because nutrition is such a huge component of athletics and performance. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. But our role is we're sports nutrition assistants along with Ben, who came to support us today. Um, so we're, we're three of the five um, grad sports nutrition assistants as well. So that kind of gives us, gives you guys too some background on, on us. So we want to explain to you all what dietetic professionals are and what is required. Um, right now we are working to become registered dietitians. Currently we can tell you right now that we are nutritionists. We have no certifications, we have nothing to tell you that would be like, oh yeah, we can tell you everything about nutrition. Um, but registered dietitians actually have to go through a lot more uh, certification steps to actually show that we are deserving of the title. Um, and so the things that we have to do are a didactic program in dietetics, which is what Jess and I are in currently. We are also required to do a minimum of 1,200 hours of supervised practice. So that can come either in a dietetic internship, which is what we all just finished applying to right now, or you could do a coordinated program, which combines the didactic program and dietetics with the 1,200 hours as well, or you can do an individualized supervised practice pathway, which is something that Drexel holds right now for um, possibilities as to get those 1,200 hours. After we do that 10 to 12 month program, then you are eligible to sit for the registration examination. And then after that, you hopefully pass and you are now a certified as a registered dietitian. Every five years, you do have to maintain your continuing education as well. So we are constantly learning what's happening new in our field so that we stay abreast of what's current and what trends might be happening or what science has come up and so that we know that we're well informed. So all of this to say that dietitians are basically experts in nutrition. And there are different facets of nutrition. Um, there's clinical nutrition, there's community nutrition. Something that's gaining a lot of momentum right now is sports nutrition. So if you guys are big sports fans, you might notice that a lot of your favorite collegiate teams or professional teams are starting to hire sports nutrition um, dietitians to join their team instead of relying on their strength and conditioning coaches to get their athletes into the best shape possible for performance. The reason being 
is athletes have very, very different nutrition needs from the general public. So any nutrition advice you might hear applies to people who do not lift two times a day, they're not doing two a days, they're not running, you know, miles and miles at a time getting ready for meets and matches. So they require more carbohydrates as their primary fuel source. They require more protein to rebuild any muscle that might have been broken down. And they also require more micronutrients to help support the body. So where does that come into play with what we're doing? Student athletes at Drexel, so many of them, right? We're a division one school. Um, student athletes are in a really strange part of their life because they're trying to navigate adulthood. Everybody remembers undergrad, right? That was kind of awkward times and trying to learn how to adult um, while trying to get your first degree. And it's a lot of pressure on these students because they also have academic requirements they need to meet in order to continue to have eligibility. They have heavy training requirements because if they're not training, they can't win. They also have meal plans given to them um, and a fueling station. We actually just have um, built and set up a fueling station for our athletes here. Um, that supports their nutrition requirements and that also reduces their need to go out and shop on their own because everything is basically provided for them. And like I mentioned earlier, they're learning how to transition into adulthood. So kind of tricky. So where do we come in? We're trying to uh, bridge the knowledge gap that these student athletes might have in sports nutrition. So we've developed something that we call the Sports Nutrition Training Toolkit for dietetic professionals. And basically what we're trying to do is train dietetic professionals, so registered dietitians, how to use a proven and really effective model to conduct grocery store tours. Um, the reason behind it is because if you educate in the grocery store setting, right, like it's more hands-on, it's more applicable, it's you're going to retain more information than a lecture or you know being taught. Um, because you can like pick up things, you can remember, oh, okay, yeah, this is what they said. All of this so that we can teach, equip, and empower our athletes so that they know how to shop for the right foods in the event that they need to supplement their meal plan or they need to supplement a fueling station or let's say they don't have all of that on their scholarship, so they need to shop on their own. So our toolkit includes a pre and post tour knowledge questionnaire. So this is our way of measuring how much the athletes learned on their 45 minute tour. It determines how effective we were in conducting all of that. And we're using a really validated survey um, with permission from Dr. Barbara Hugenboom. We reached out to her, very nice. Um, but they have a, um, a really good sports nutrition questionnaire that we adapted for our purposes. So where we kind of came up with the idea to actually lead these grocery store tours is from the Produce for Better Health Foundation. They are a nonprofit that their mission is to educate people on the importance of eating your fruits and vegetables, and they were able to include this and incorporate that for um, participants by having them go through a grocery store tour and by teaching them the importance of consuming their fruits and vegetables for you know overall health and gaining their micronutrients that they need. And what they, they, in creating their own store tour, they also came up with a grant. And this awards funding and materials to dietetic internships across the country so that dietetic interns um, are able to use part of their 1,200 hours, they can work towards that, by conducting these grocery store tours and giving them the skills so that they learn how to communicate with consumers and with future clients on how to actually walk through a grocery store and be like, hey, these are the things that you should be putting into your cart. You know, and these are the ways that we are able to teach you skills on how to grocery shop on your own, so that way you can create meals and recipes at home that are home cooked. And so, with those dietetic interns, they are able to use them and have them educate their peers, so other people that are like pairing with co colleges and their athletes. And so our Drexel ISPE, so the Individualized Supervised Practice Pathway that we talked about earlier, we applied for that grant and received it two years ago. And with that application through our dietetic interns, they were able to see that there was an increase in knowledge by using that survey um, on the importance of fruits and vegetables after the tour. So just a general overview of the procedures we've had to date. Um, so in the development of our sports nutrition training toolkit, we use the Produce for Better Health Store Tour Training Guide as our foundation. 
And then we decided that a post-tour questionnaire wasn't enough. How do we measure how much someone actually learned while they were on the tour? So then we added a validated questionnaire to be administered at the beginning and at the end. Um, and then you can't just focus on general fruit and vegetable requirements, right? Because like we said earlier, that's for the general public. Athletes have very different needs. So we included different stops within the store where we focus on carbohydrates, where we focus specifically on snacks, where we focus on hydration, um, while incorporating fresh fruits and vegetables. And then to, uh, to determine how effective our dietetic interns are in administering the tour, we decided to come up with a scoring rubric to see if the material is actually um, taught well. So this is the scoring rubric that we developed basically on a scale of one to five. Um, and it, as a dietetic intern, your purpose is to get as much training as you can so that when you are a registered dietitian, you feel confident to help your clients. So basically the descriptions just talk about are you adequate for an entry level dietitian standards or do we need more improvement or are you excellent? So just a one to five scale for that. Um, and then an overall score for organization of the tour, how professional you are, how, um, how did you implement it, did you contact the, the grocery store managers prior, um, were you speaking clearly at an appropriate volume, did you answer questions, different things like that. So that's how we determine the efficacy of the dietetic interns. So for us, what we were able to do, we're also TAs with the Nutrition Sciences Department, so we were able to take the Intermediate Nutrition Undergraduate class on a pilot tour when we were, we were leading the tours ourselves and taking them through, and we had them role play as like they were athletes and what questions would athletes want to ask in the grocery store. So with that, we were able to do our first one. We learned a lot. We got a great feedback from that. And then we ended up taking the rest of our Center for Nutrition and Performance team with us as well to the grocery store. And we were able to gain more feedback. And they have a little more expertise in nutrition. So they were able to tell us, like, oh, wait, maybe you should more emphasize upon this and oh, make sure to include that part. And that really helped a lot. So we also have a really great partnership with the Philadelphia Union, and they have something called the Youth Soccer Club. And we were able to take parents of those of the people that are in the Youth Soccer Club, and we took them on a tour at the King of Prussia Acme out there. And through educating them, we were able to talk with them and teach them, like, yeah, your diet as a parent is going to be very different from your child athlete and what they need and what their requirements are. Um, just uh, about a month ago now, we trained our own Drexel ISTE interns, and we had a training session with them. We taught them how to do it so that they could take it on and teach Drexel athletics um, and Drexel athletes and take them on the tours. So we actually partnered with Fresh Grocer, and then now we are currently working on our IRB approval. So, like Leah mentioned earlier, we took the parents of the Philadelphia Youth Soccer Club. Is anyone familiar with the Philadelphia Union? Any soccer fans? Yeah. Okay. Has anyone heard of the YSC? Okay. Awesome. <laughs> so they basically train um, young athletes, and they they train them in hopes of developing their skills so that they can play for the Philadelphia Union when they become adults. And so they live in homes with house moms, and the house moms are responsible for taking them to practice, for cooking all of their meals, doing their laundry, making sure that you know everything is taken care of so that they can focus on soccer. So these house moms have a lot of pressure, a lot of responsibility to cook for these, um, these athletes that live in their homes. And they loved being on the tour because they were saying, oh, well, I didn't realize it was okay to give my athletes chocolate milk. And we we're like, yeah, it's a great recovery drink. So we got really awesome post for feedback from them. They emailed us. We emailed back. Um, it, it was phenomenal. They loved it. And then these are just photos from the ISPE intern tours that we had um, where they took our, um, some of our athletes around Fresh Grocer and basically taught them how to shop on their own because some of the athletes who participated don't have a meal plan and they only have access to the fueling station. So they do rely on self-preparation for food. So there are some challenges that we have seen with doing and trying to implement our supermarket tour training. Um, our athlete recruitment can get really, it's a little challenging there and difficult just because they have such a rigorous schedule that they have to stick to. Between practice, attending class, 
and studying for classes and games and all that stuff, like their schedule is very packed in. So it's hard for them, to, for us to require them, okay, walk a mile over to Fresh Grocer, come out and come see us and learn about nutrition for 45 minutes. Um, so we are seeing some challenges there and we're trying to make that a little easier. It does play into um, accessibility because where Drexel is, kind of right where the Drexel Rec Center is, is about a mile from Trader Joe's, from Fresh Grocer, and a a little over a mile to Whole Foods up in Fairmount. And so we're kind of right in the middle, and that's not quite so accessible if you don't have a car that can take all your groceries that you like to bring back. Um, and then we, we like to use Fresh Grocer because that tends to be more of an applicable supermarket that has a lot more products and stuff than like Trader Joe's, they tend to be more exclusive and Trader Joe's material is what they would be selling there. So we do like to use Fresh Grocer because that's more representative of what people are used to in terms of supermarket. Um, so that is some, a challenge that we've seen there. And then also we want to limit the number of our guests on our tour. So we can't have, like, if we took all of you into a grocery store, that would be very overwhelming. The grocery store probably wouldn't really like it because we'd be blocking their pathways and people wouldn't be able to shop. Um, so we do collaborate with the grocery store managers beforehand saying like, hey, we're coming in, we'd love to work with you to make sure that you know that we're coming in at this time and that we're going to have a group of people walking through. We limit it to about five athletes per tour just so that we have seen that that number, make sure that we can talk with them at a reasonable volume and we're not yelling or anything like that in the store and also so that we're not in the way when people are still wanting to grocery shop on their own. So we've turned out that that is a good number. So with our future directions of where we want to go with our tour is to gain IRB approval. We do want to have more tours with Drexel ISPE and hopefully a way to make it more accessible for our Drexel athletes to come with us and attend these tours and to learn more about sports nutrition. And then we are writing our final training manual because we do want to scale this up and make it so that, like similar to Produce for Better Health and how they have their grants, we want to create our own grant that people would apply to so that they can use our training materials and bring it out to their schools and their athletes. And so when they apply to receive these training man manuals, we'll make sure that they also administer those pre and post tour surveys so that we can measure how the knowledge is actually changing, how that supermarket tour is impacting people's sports nutrition knowledge. And then we're able to use that for trends and future research. So it's really awesome. It is a continuous process that we're working on and there's a lot of possibilities that we can go with this direction and how just, you know, we're learning so much how nutrition can really play such an impact. And if that makes athletes, you know, one second faster than your opponent or that's going to make you just a little bit stronger, that's that competitive edge. And if nutrition is the way to get there, then we definitely want to be behind that. clarification question since I'm moderator. What is a fueling station? I don't think I've been in a cafeteria in a long time. <laughs> um, so the fueling station is basically an area where, well for our drugs will have it's kind of like a little lounge, similar to this, a little on the smaller scale, um, and then there's going to be different snacks that would help them. So it's supposed to be like kind of a place where they can relax, but also be able to fuel themselves in between meals. So it's not like we're offering a full-on meal for them at the fueling station, but they're able to grab some chocolate milk, or some yogurt, or bananas, or granola bars, things like that, as a grab-and-go kind of thing. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Do you have any questions in our audience? Somebody asked me first, Greg. So when you're talking about storage, uh, storing as much energy as possible into your fibers, and you store a huge amount of would be the objective because solar power, you don't want to have a basement full of material trying to keep your energy for the next day. So it keeps getting smaller and more powerful, almost like a stack of dynamite. Are you thinking of possibly, or maybe you have, limiting the discharge rate of your material so that it's not a cascading breakaway thermal runaway like your lithium ion batteries? Once you have a, a perforation in the materials, it just exponentially goes into the fission reactor 
that maybe the structure itself will limit the amount of current that can be released when you're trying to do that? Um, yeah, I mean, that's definitely much more on a device design scale. Um, there are a lot of different ways. So for the fibers that I showed you, they're on the non-lithium side, so they aren't very reactive. Um, so there are other people who are approaching on, uh, the actual lithium issue, like lith like because lithium is so reactive and it will ignite. Um, so there are ways to, to change it on a materials level, um, not just the processing, not just nanofibers, um, but that, that's much more on a, a larger scale. That would be other components of the device or electrical systems controlling it. Um, to control the rate at which it discharges. Okay, because I was thinking that your, your nanofiber, they store the energy, or, or they just conduct it at this point? Yeah, so for, it depends on what device. So for, for supercapacitors and um, for batteries, they are storing energy. So when they store it in that capacitor, if you short it at the end, do you have a limit current, or could you design part of your fibers to limit that storage as it, as it goes out of the fiber? Um, I haven't thought about that, limiting it at a nanofiber level. Well, see, because yeah. that, would, that would give you automatic safety current. Yeah. You wouldn't have to worry about the device there. Yeah, I mean, I have read, there's uh, some people looking at the separator, so that's the insulating layer between the two, that have a self, like a thermal runaway um, self shut off. Uh, so it just melts it. So it forms a completely solid layer, and it coats the lithium. So there, some people are working on that with nanofibers. Can you, can you electrospin one fiber with multiple materials? Can you stack them? Yes, yeah, so there's the other ways to do it. Um, core shell spinning, so coaxial spinning. Um, some people are hypothesizing triaxial. I'm sure some people have demonstrated it, but it's a pretty complex system. So obviously you're increasing complexity, mm -hmm. um, which would make it even harder to scale up. Yeah, so it, following up on your question, it seems like it might be yeah, possible to build some like a diode structure into it where it yeah. can flow in one direction. But then it would be a lot harder because they're so small nanofibers to connect just the ends. Yes. Um, so yeah, it brings up a lot of complexity. Yeah. That would be Except that that like the issue is you go to a normal size, you go maybe to you know.
little pricier or something like that, but you can get a lot more content for the same price, but it might not be as, you know, as healthy for you. So that's something that we, we try to offer different options when we go through the store and we're like, we're pointing out like, hey, this might be a little better for your budget here. And that's something that we talk about as the people we try to for, but we don't put that in charge for it. So you do kind of, so in the, the manual, the training tool that you have there are a lot of tips and guidelines and just general sports nutrition um, facts that a lot of dietitians should know. One of them is fresh fruits and vegetables. The nutrition content is either exactly the same or, you know, it's pretty on par with frozen, right? The reason all my frozen foods are, they're frozen to keep the freshness. So frozen foods are okay as long as you're making sure it doesn't have, like, the cheesy sauce, you know, the raw right. added syrup. Right, exactly. So so we do emphasize that because we as students are on budget. I mean, grad students, we're all on budgets, right? So uh, we we do teach towards making sure it's budget savvy. Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> my question was on, you said one of the biggest challenges is getting the athletes to come to the store to do training with you. Have you thought about doing like an online module, so, so, so like a virtual store that they could do it any time that's convenient for them? And that way, it would also take the pressure off uh, having somebody there to just do it and then to check the company can be kind of off questions that they need more. Okay, yeah, yeah, definitely we do we do like to emphasize like the in-person interaction with the different products because we have people pulling things off the shelves and being like, okay, like this product has this type of ratio of carbs to protein or fats to carbs. And so by having them actually look at the nutrition labels in person, they're able to become more educated on their own. And so having an online thing would be so great and we can definitely scale it out to more people, correct? But we're trying to also make it a little more individualized and personalized for the actual attendance of the floor.
people are using it for um, filtration, water filtration. So you can electrospin, you know, some people will see these, um, oh, it, it's just a, a porous filter. Um, and you can electrospin those and they're ready to use. Just bring up this tool, cut it out. I don't think they cut it like that in the industry, but ideally. <laughs> So I also had a question about scaling up, and when you're making these nanofibers, how much of that is required for putting into a battery, and how long does it take to get that? Um, so it really depends on the device itself, like what size you're going for, like for my little point cells. Um, the rate that I'm spinning, it takes about 10 hours to spin the amount of material I want. But it's also because I'm collecting on a broader collector, so it's a, it thins out with a wider surface area. Um, but also, I'm using a really low flow rate, you know, at, at a scale up stage you have, and I'm using one jet. When you scale up, they use many, many, many jets, much higher flow rates, um, higher voltages. They can just mass produce fibers very quickly. There's a couple of really good YouTube videos where they're showing how they can do it, and it's literally just forming a sheet within 30 seconds that they can pick up. Um, so on an industrial scale, it could be very, very fast. But for our purposes, we spin pretty slow. So I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and ask the last question. But actually, I want to ask something across all of you, which which took me some work to figure that out. Um, yeah, but but something something it is my job, right? I'm I'm right now going to earn my moderator's job. Um, so something I I've gotten asked uh, over the years presenting research is sort of what led me down my path to my research. And you all studied something else before you came here to pursue graduate studies. Can you sort of talk about what you studied before and how that led to your current projects? Engineering at all, so I was like, PhD, that's for me. I want to do research. 
Uh, I like the chemical engineering foundation, but the job that you get out of a bachelor's is typically process engineering. Don't like it, it's not for me. Um, so I came to Drexel with the intention of doing more bio research, because that was my concentration, uh, bioengineering. Um, and it just so happened I met our advisor, uh, who was so enthusiastic and passionate about her work, and she's describing this energy stuff to me that was so foreign. And I was a little bit daunted by it because I didn't do any energy stuff. But um, just after talking to her, and then I started reading articles about it, and I wanted to work with her on a project I knew nothing about. I was pretty nervous about it, but as soon as I jumped in, um, I just really liked it a lot. And I think it was mostly my advisor's uh, passion and motivation that really got me into it. And then it just kind of took off from there. And here I am, I'm using it. Excellent. Loving energy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you all, all three of you. You get a great presentation. Thanks for all the feedback. So one more round of applause.